Let me take a selfie. Thanks, Dr. Cheever. Um, I feel privileged to be able to do this today, guys. Um, I'm gonna get kind of personal with you and use this uh, use this time that I have with you to kind of introduce myself a little bit and also kind of splash a little humor in there and kind of work with a little bit of uh, thought processing and sort of try to program some behavior that we want to see in our future uh, practitioners. Can everybody see the screen? Am I just too old? Does anybody know who this is? Okay, did anybody know what movie it's from? Very good, very good. All right. Um, who knows what kind of motorcycles he's, he's riding? <laughs> Anyways, uh, if anybody has a power cord, I need one. Of my laptop's going to die, but okay. So this is me. This is my family. And this story uh, that I'm going to tell you today is about me and my family. Thank you. Can you help me out? Mm -hmm. um, I've got three kids and an ex-wife. And uh, my son on the left, he's Elliot, then Bennett, and Sylvia. Elliot is, uh, he's 12, going on 13, and he loves snowboarding and, and mechanics. Bennett is, uh, he's turning uh, 18, actually, on, uh, or 17 on Saturday, and then Sylvia is 9. So this is my family. And uh, just last week, as a matter of fact, uh, I went to the kid's house on Sunday, and lo and behold, my ex-wife asked me if I'd like to go on a ride with them to the Draper Temple. Has anybody ever been up there before? Yeah? It's pretty up there. It's really nice up there. And so I said, I was surprised because I hadn't gotten in a car with my ex-wife in quite a long time. And so I just thought that was a kick. So I got in the car. Well, I was going to get in the car. And... Um, this isn't her car, obviously, <clears throat> but this is a car I like. It's a it's an H1 Hummer diesel. Anybody like diesels here? I'm a fan. So she had a Volvo, and uh, what happened was, um, you know, I used to work on the cars all the time, and I'd make sure they were running correct. And I know she hadn't been... Um, you know, paying attention to the car very much, and she started the engine, and we were, we were about to take off, and I, and I, I thought I, I heard metal kind of grinding inside the engine, and I said to her, I said, hey, so do you have any lights on in the dashboard? She's like, yeah, yeah, there's been this light on for like two months now. I'm like, really? So how many people know how an engine works? Everybody pre-mechanical here? Pistons, valves, oil? Okay, can you guys see the picture on the left, how there's this kind of merry-go-round crankshaft that goes around and pushes the piston up and it sparks. And there's oil in the bottom of the engine, and the oil keeps everything lubricated. And what happens if there's no oil? Metal on metal contact. And so what happens when metal contacts metal? We get heat, right? And then what happens? Right, so, I, so I, I said, hey, pop the hood for me. And I looked under the hood. I pulled the, who knows what a dipstick is? Anybody not know what a, what a dipstick is? <laughs> okay. So do you see the picture on the bottom here? Okay, so she didn't have any oil at all on the dipstick, right? And so I opened up the little uh, the oil lid or whatever and whatnot, and there started to be steam kind of coming out of the engine. And so what do you think I'm thinking? Holy cow. Like, it's just a matter of time before you're driving the kids around and the thing just breaks down on the freeway or whatever. So it's a Sunday, and she doesn't shop on Sunday. Good thing I do. So I went and bought her two quarts of oil. <laughs> And it needs like five quarts. So I put two quarts of oil in there, but 
quite a story. We made it up to the temple, but, you know, um, I'm just asking myself, why? Why did she let the oil get so low? And, you know, um, has anybody seen this video yet? But first, let me take a selfie. Anybody seen that? No, it's called Selfie. It's on YouTube. You can go ahead and check that out one time. But social media is a huge distraction for her. And so I think she's just forgot about the oil, even though there's a warning sign, right? Like, so there's a warning sign on the dashboard, but she's unfortunately so distracted that she's not really paying attention to the signs. And ultimately, it could lead to her car breaking down, right? And what would that look like? Maybe it would be in the middle of the night. Maybe it would be during the day. Maybe it would be during rush hour traffic. So we're not talking dentistry here, but what we're talking about here is service. So who here knows about service and, and how it relates to cars? How often do you have to uh, get your oil changed in your car? Every six months. Six months. Anybody else? Okay. So what if you're taking selfies and, and you wait 100,000 miles to change your oil? What happens? Is, it gonna, is your engine going to break down? Probably. So I'm a big fan of the Porsche. Anybody else like Porsche? Can, we, can I get a raise of hand? Porsche? No Porsche? Yeah. Okay. Good. <clears throat> So I like motocross. Anybody here like motocross? I used to ride quite a bit in Colorado. And these, these are high caliber uh, pro athletes. And um, their bikes, they get torn down and rebuilt after every race. Um, you see on the right hand side here, we've got an odometer that reads 196,000 miles. Is that car going to have more wear and tear on it than a brand new car? You think you're going to need to service that vehicle more often than a new car? Yeah. So I'm just trying to introduce a couple of just basic concepts here. And then apply it to dentistry. So the definition of health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, and that's by the World Health Organization in 1948. Um, the mission of the CDC is to promote health and quality of life by preventing and controlling disease, injury, and disability. Okay, there's a key word there, preventing. And you notice how we're introducing this new catchphrase, quality of life. So in order to uh, know what health is, we also have to know what disease is. Um, can you guys read that? Is that big enough for you to read? Is it small? It's pretty small, right? Okay. Anyways, a disease is basically a condition that affects um, an organ system in the body. We have infectious diseases. We have internal dysfunctions. We have signs and symptoms. Uh, there's behaviors. Uh, we have variations in structures and functions that leads to lower quality of life and ultimately uh, morbidity and mortality. So in our business, the business, the people business, uh, the business of dentistry, we have a silent epidemic going on. Um, it's an oral disease, it affects America's most vulnerable citizens, poor children, the elderly, and many members of uh, racial and ethnic minority groups. It's dental caries, the disease is the most common non-communicable disease of mankind. Did anybody know that? Kind of, kind of a wake up call, right? Here in the Utah Valley, we have a lot of dentists, but we don't have a lot of dentists in the world, worldwide population. 
And so let's talk about prevention. There's, there's two different types of dentistry out there. There is surgical dentistry and there's non-surgical dentistry. A lot of your career, you guys are gonna be focusing on surgical intervention. You're gonna to need to build your clinical skills and your aptitude to work a drill and to perform mechanical functions. Additionally, you're gonna to have to use your brain to uh, come up with preventive prescriptions for your patients. A quote on the bottom, assessing a patient with higher extreme risk for developing caries is similar to diagnosing a cavity on a radiograph. Okay, I want you guys to get that in your brain. Assessing a patient with a high or extreme risk for developing cavities is similar to diagnosing a cavity on a radiograph. The term paradigm describes a philosophy of science. A, um, you guys can read this. Okay, I don't, I don't know if I need to read it for you. A lot of my students get irritated when I read off the slides. But um, this is a quote about G.B. Black. Who knows who G.B. Black was? Raise your hand. Anybody want to tell me who G.B. Black was? Can I just get a quick? The father of modern dentistry. Um, when we think of G.B. Black, what do we... What do you think of? Like, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of GB Black? Anyone? Classification of caries or restorations? Or both? Both. <clears throat> when I think of GB Black, I think of amalgam fillings, big amalgam fillings with big mechanical preparations and teeth. It's what you guys learn how to do every day. Get your drill out, you drill on the teeth, you plug the fillings, okay? G.B. Black was actually more of a cariologist than he was a mechanical dentist, okay? You guys need to understand that. And if somebody knows how to keep this window from popping up on my computer, please come on up and, and fix it for me. I'm having an issue with it. So, um, Oh, it doesn't? Okay. Thank you. So Black defined the paradigm with, um, within which further research was to be conducted during the following years, and the profession accepted his lead. However, it is not expected that the parameters of a profession should remain unchanged over a substantial period. So it is suggested that the dental profession should, at this time, recognize a new paradigm. This was written a long time ago. Black settled a vigorous argument of the day. When did he live? Anybody know when G.B. Black was alive? 1983? Early 20th century. So this is a long time ago we're talking about here. He settled a vigorous argument of that time by stating clearly that caries always begins on the outside of the tooth, never from within. He noted that it consists, you guys can just read along with me. Um, he noted that it consists of dissolution of calcium salts by lactic acid followed by a decomposition of the gelatinous body of the organic matrix, quote unquote. He went on to reprimand the profession. He reprimanded the profession, stating clearly that the complete divorcement of dental practice from studies of the pathology of dental caries, which has existed in the past, is an anomaly in science that should not continue. So we were having issues with this in the early 20th century, and surely it still exists today. Microscopy, microbiology, and chemistry were in their infancy back then, and Black used them to their full extent to demonstrate the bacteria were related to both caries and disease of the gums and surrounding soft tissue. I wonder, what would happen if G.B. Black were alive today and he could be on our third floor. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be great. I'd like to read a little bit of Black's quote-unquote farsighted statement. In a farsighted statement, Black postulated that 
The cause of immunity and susceptibility to dental caries would necessarily be found in conditions of the general system influencing the qualities of the mixed fluids of their mouth by which the teeth were surrounded. Caries fulfills the dictionary definition of a quote unquote disease. Some of our medical colleagues would argue that our jobs are somewhat insignificant. But here we have Black saying that caries fulfills the dictionary definition of a disease. Lack of depth in the current understanding of the cause of the disease uh, is limited. He was limited to a mechanistic approach wherein the lesion was simply described and restored without the ability to address the disease at a more fundamental level. So as you guys are learning these things, as you guys are focused so hard on learning how to work your drill, you need to keep in mind that our profession is not winning the war right now. And I don't care how many class two amalgams or composites or crowns or root canals you do, you're not gonna cure the you're not gonna keep you're not gonna win the war. You wouldn't be sitting in this classroom today if we as a profession had handled our business. We're in the middle of an epidemic. This cycle ensured that dentists were kept busy to the extent that even today, up to 75% of general practitioners' time is devoted to replacement dentistry. Why? Why is that? Anybody have an idea? Did you come to dental school thinking that 75% of your time would be spent replacing the work of other dentists? Is that a new thought for you? Maybe, maybe not. Why? I don't even tire, but care with them, please. Interaction's good. Anybody? You didn't solve the problem. Didn't solve the problem the first time. You fixed the symptom instead of the rest of the underlying problem. So the day I started dental school, one, well, of the dean, one of the deans was a microbiologist, and he said, "My goal is to put you out of out of business." This was 1989. He said, "I'm going to come up with an immunization for strep mutans that will put you out of business." He retired. He never found it. And we've got to consider, are we tooth jockeys or are we scientists? Are we mechanics or are we scientists? That's, that's my point. Get a question on the back door. Tooth jockey, I love that. <clears throat> my nickname in dental school, I made it for myself, Tooth Monk. Okay. I know. I know. I did. But oh. I did have comments about that. My comment was, we live in a world full of entropy. And so we're going to have to, no matter how good our restoration is going to be, it will fail. You know, whether or not that's an internal problem or from an external source. So we are going to have to repair almost anything we see from someone else or ourselves if we're in practice long enough. Perfect. We live in a world of entropy. I love it. I love it very much. Very insightful. Okay. Anybody seen this, the tooth cycle? Okay. Anybody like bicycles? Anybody ride bikes here? Probably don't have time. You, just, you guys just use your drills all the time. Okay, so here we go. We've got a small cavity. Gets a sealant. First filling, $100. Second filling, what does that say? $150. Third filling. Fourth filling, crown, root canal, lost tooth. Isn't that amazing? That's our profession. Hopefully, hopefully it will it will hopefully we'll start to change some thinking here. Why? Why do we have to use our drill? Why do we have to keep going back into the tooth? Every time we pull out our drill, it's like we're pulling out a gun, we're going to war. Why are we fighting the war over and over and over again. Part of it could be entropy, part of it could be our own ignorance. Define entropy. 
Does everybody know what entropy is? State of organization constantly going toward disorganization, falling apart. Perfect. A perfect example would be a hydroxyapatite crystal dissolving in an acidic solution, right? Okay, so the only effective means of controlling disease appeared to be surgical removal of the demineralized portion of an affected tooth along with any surrounding tooth structure that was considered to be at risk, that is, the extension for prevention. Dentists were known as dental surgeons because their main duty appeared to be surgical removal of the tooth structure. Little time devoted to teaching patients to understand the value of preventive measures that were beginning to be understood. Scant attention is paid to controlling the disease itself. Let's do some thinking. Anybody recognize the picture from the right? What movie is that from? Yes. Okay, let's do some thinking here. <clears throat> what is risk? Can somebody tell me what risk is? You go to Vegas, you, you're at the blackjack table. What's risk? What's that? An option of failing. Okay. Is there an option of winning too? Right? So why do we even gamble if we're going to lose? There's a chance we might win. Any other definitions of risk? Probability of negative outcome. Probability of negative outcome. Okay. So the house always wins, right? Somebody's gambled here. Somebody's lost some money here. All right. So I'd like to introduce you to this term, deferred morbidity. That's kind of what risk is when we're talking about health. Deferred morbidity, deferred mortality. Um, some aspects of health do not appear to have a direct bearing on the quality of life at the time of assessment. For example, can somebody give me an example? A dental cavity, right? Is that going to have a direct impact on a patient's health? Immediate? No. Dr. Cheever, how many days on average in the nation do children miss from dental infections? Thousands and thousands. Thousands and thousands of days. Yeah. And it's inversely related with their uh, household income and parents' education. Inversely related. What does inversely related mean? The lower the income, the higher the risk. Perfect. So does this affect the child's quality of life? If they're in pain, certainly. How about the parents? How many hours of work are lost every year because mom has to take the kids for the dental appointment? Endless. Endless hours. How much income? Oh, I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's a lot. The house wins, right? Oh, the house wins. And don't build a palace. So the mission of the CDC is to promote health and quality of life by preventing and controlling disease. Have we won the battle? Anybody? Who's a rock climber here? Anybody rock climb? Anybody know what a crux is? You go to Momentum. Anybody been to Momentum? You jump on a route. You go up. The hardest part of the route the route is the, is the holds that you have to hold on to to get to the top. The hardest part of the route is called the crux. Sometimes you might have to move your body into a strange position to get through, the, get through that section of the wall. Okay, in this particular situation, there's a sloper, something really hard to hang on to. So a crux is a puzzling or difficult problem, an unsolved question. carries management. The crux of the exhaustive process of the diagnosis of any disease is its control and cure. Signs, symptoms, and the elimination of the cause of the disease, um, prevention of the disease. I'm, not gonna try, I'm trying not to bore you guys. 
Uh, Carrie's disease is managed by background level treatments directed against the dominant causative factors. These treatments are mostly non-invasive in nature. Did you hear that? Non-invasive in nature. Every time you pull out your needle, is that invasive or non-invasive? Can you use your drill without using your needle? What percentage of the time that you use your drill is the patient going to be numb? 80, 70, 60, 90, right. So why then are we managing our disease with our drill? I don't know. We'll find out, I guess. We've got a lot of different insights on this. Carrie's lesion management addresses the demen and remen cycle of the tooth um, by using both a non-invasive and invasive treatment. Unfortunately, we're just using a lot more invasive management than we are non-invasive. Again, signs, symptoms, and elimination of the cause. Here we have a kid. Um, I think everyone's probably done this, um, looking at bugs through a little magnifying glass. Okay. The crux of the exhaustive process, the diagnosis of any disease, is its control and cure. What causes dental disease? Anybody? What causes dental disease? Anybody have a clue? Anybody, wanna, anybody know? Pardon? Bacteria. Anything else? Neglect. Neglect. Behavior, right? Selfies? So this is an SEM of uh, strep mutans. All right. Two main causes I heard in dental school that kind of stuck with me, and this isn't science, guys, so don't quote me on it, but two main causes, bugs and forces. Okay, we got bugs and forces. Quick question. How does this represent the management of signs, symptoms, and elimination of the cause of the disease? How does this prevent the recurrence of the disease? Did you know that actually taking a drill to a tooth increases the odds of a patient developing another cavity? Food for thought. What do these two things have in common, guys? Absolutely nothing. Okay, so I'm going to jump through a case real quick. This is uh, just a case that highlights forces and how they destroy teeth. We've got some uh, quick diagnosis. You guys should be pretty quick to follow this, right? Shouldn't need to really repeat any of these things. All right, I'm just going to toggle through all of this stuff. Here's an x-ray. Anybody see any cavities? Nope. Any cavities there? Got a piece of calc on the distal of the 16, but that's about it. Guy hasn't been to the dentist forever. You can tell his teeth are kind of worn down a little bit. So look at what we have here. Kind of got a big chunk of uh, the distal of, what is that, 18? Broken off. Missing piece of tooth. Anybody want me to go slower? Just let me know if you want me to slow down. Anybody ever um, used a transilluminator? Quote, it is the most underutilized diagnostic tool that we have in dentistry, unquote. So these are how we treat cracked teeth. You know, we could go through this whole ALOR article, and uh, you know, we could do that if we wanted to, but I'm not going to do that today. We're going to move on to bugs. What is that uh, diagnosis? Cracked tooth. Crack tooth. It got pulled. And have no carries. No carries. 
sharp, sharp pain on release. Guy couldn't sleep, came in, horrible pain, broken in half. Okay? Forces. Forces can kill teeth. And if you didn't notice, your mouth is nothing but a big machine. Right? Just a big machine. Just a big nutcracker. A lot of forces going on inside your mouth. Okay, so bugs. All kinds of bugs in the oral cavity. Anybody see any cavities on these x-rays? Cavities? Okay, how old is this kid? Estimations, estimations. I'll give you five seconds. Four, three, two. Okay, good. Good. Tons of cavities. Do you know what this kid eats for breakfast? Mountain Dew and Cheetos. <laughs> Take x-rays on this guy and download him. And he also has an AK-47 on his computer. Danger. Alright, so take, take a look at tooth number four. What do you see there? Come on. What do we have? Recurrent? We got a DO, right? Probably a composite, and then a mesial cavity. So here's my question. How come they just didn't do an MOD? I think this filling was done like six months ago. Right? Anyways, tons of cavities here. What's going on? What's going on? Bugs or forces here, guys? Bugs. Right? What kind of bugs? Strebutans, lactobacilli, right? A couple more x-rays for you. Let's toggle through here. Okay. Do you guys want to do a radiographic diagnostic breakout or just want me to keep going? It's 3.30. Breakout? You're too lazy for a breakout. Huh? Comfortable? All right, let's keep going. So we've got all kinds of restorations here. We've got an existing DO on 4 and 13 that we're done with the last six months. We saw that the dentist did not extend the preps into the other surface, which contained decay. Right? So imagine this kid comes into your practice. You shoot off a couple x-rays. You take a look. You're like, okay, they just used $700 of their insurance benefit this year. Now I just have to redo the same fillings. How fun. Right? happens every day guys every day radiographic lesions here we go see the ones with the question mark next to them you want me to go back to the x-ray okay take note of the ones with the question mark okay what do we have write them down on the paper paper and pen okay now let's go back if I can Okay, what was the first one? Two? What's on three? Distal caries, right? What's on two? Maybe. Maybe. Okay, what was the other one? 31? 30. Okay. Distal caries, for sure, right? What about mesial? What happened on four? Do we want to repeat history? Okay. What was the other tooth? 19. What do we have? Distal carriage, maybe? What's on 20? Distal carries on 20. What about mesial on 19? Is carries not an infectious disease? Does it not spread from one tooth to the other? All right, just a couple quick, quick questions for you. How old was this kid again? Roughly? 16, 17. Cheetos and Mountain Dew for breakfast every day. What does he have for lunch? 
Cheetos and Mountain Dew. What does he have for dinner? Pizza and Mountain Dew. Perfect. Quick question. What is his most likely socioeconomic status? High, medium, or low? Low. Good. What is the most likely level of his mother and father's educational attainment? Low. Right? Yes? This could happen to anybody. Statistically, they're low, but if it's you and your parents are wealthy, you're an outlier, but you still have Right, he could be rich. He could be riding on the plastic, just driving by the gas station every day and picking up, you know, a 24 pack of Mountain Dew and it's got it on the back of the car because he just got his license. Right? Is he going to be in the Marine Corps? <laughs> <laughs> anybody know what this is? Has anybody seen this? Okay. Can you see this on the screen when you get up here? This is important, guys. See here. We've got carries risk indicators, low risk, moderate risk, high risk. So did this patient have carious tooth in the last 12 months? Um, is there more than one area of demon enamel or white spot? Do you think there's visible plaque on this kid's teeth? Does he have radiographic enamel caries? Okay. What about strep mutans? Okay. Possible. We haven't done any diagnostic testing yet, but most likely is high strep mutans. Right? So what is this kid? Low, medium, or high risk? High risk. So how does this impact your treatment plan? We're going to be conservative. Take a little bit of a nail off. Yeah, we're just going to be conservative dentists. You know, conservative dentists for a conservative kid drinking Mountain Dew every day. After considering the risk assessment, would you do a filling on the two mesial? What about the 30 mesial? And the 19 and the 20. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> Keep in mind, guys, that has no, uh, we didn't take into consideration at all the strep mutans level. Okay, I didn't give you any of that information. Do you remember when I was checking my wife's oil in her car? There was no oil on the dipstick. Right? So wouldn't it be nice to have a dipstick in every patient's mouth that you could just pull out and say, oh, look at how many strep mutants there are there. Wow, we're going to need to do something about that. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be cool. How long do you think it takes to get that reading? Anybody ever done strep mutants testing before? Anybody ever heard about strep mutants testing before? Huh? No? Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit, if we have time, it's 3.35. Any questions so far? Has this been helpful? I have a question. Yeah. By treating that more aggressively, is that for extension for prevention? Anybody? There's an irony there. I mean, GB Black says, do it this way, we want to be conservative, and yet your carriage risk is high, and we're more aggressive because we know what's coming because it's a predictable pattern. Predictable pattern. Yeah. There's not any blacks or whites. Everything in this is a, a, a shade of gray. Correct? Perfect. Yes. And our patient actually helps us to work even more in the gray area because, I mean, we could go quote about you know, four grand worth of fillings in the mouth or whatever. We can even do it in one appointment because we're super fast. We went to Roseman, right? We know how to work a drill. I guess what the kid could come back in six months and every single one of those cavities could need to be what? Replaced, right? Maybe even a year. So what is your, what do, what do you want your outcome to be like? All right? Question mark.
outcomes-based treatment. Do you feel good about doing all these fillings and then having this kid go to the dentist down the street like in a year? And every single one of your fillings has failed. What kind of dentist are you? Did you do junkie work? Or did you do the best work you could? It was just a kid. What kind of outcome are you looking for in your practice? See how that works? You can do the procedures. It's a 2393 on two. It's a 2391 on 20. You know, the insurance pays 8020. They maxed out. Their mom had to get a loan with care credit to pay you. And she's on the hook now for the next five years. 19% interest if she misses a payment. But for centuries, this mechanical solution for a biological problem prevailed. Um, an intense focus was on the art of creating good restoration. A material science advancement and technical revolution in high-speed cutting gadget, gadgets through improve, uh, though improve the quality of the restorative treatment, ironically sidelined the disease nature of dental caries. Um, we've got new curing lights, we've got new gizmos, we've got new um, all kinds of cool stuff coming out in dentistry. We're so distracted by all the cool gadgets that are coming down the line. It's hard to focus on the cause of the disease. So what makes you less distracted? Remember how I told you how my wife was pretty distracted and stuff like that? She didn't check her oil and her car almost died. Probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's still well. I only put two cords in. You think she put more oil in? What do they say? History is the best indicator of the future? Right? I think that's what Joel Berg said. So, I could approach you guys from a couple of different angles. I could approach you with the money angle, right? Uh, we just had a white coat ceremony for our new uh, D1s, and the great keynote speaker said, caveat mTOR should never replace the contract we have been given by society. Can, it, can somebody look up caveat mTOR for me and just give me the definition, please? You can tell me? Buyer beware. Buyer beware. How does that apply to dentistry? Anyone? Dr. Cheever's got all the answers, but I'd like to hear from you guys. Do you want to go into a dental office and kind of like you're buying a used car? Are we buying used cars when we're getting our disease treated? No. So why are we so focused on the money? Greed is stopping our evolution sometimes, guys, okay? Society gives us a privilege to be doctors, to work on them, not to take advantage of them. What else gets your attention? We could work a legal angle. We could talk about a, a letter showing up on your front porch. Excuse me, are you Mr. Schultz? No. Of course not. Let me go get it. So what is your cause? Hopefully, let me see if I can play this video. I don't know if the volume will be loud or not. Anybody hear of the uh, Code of Ethics? The ADA? Oh. Let me see if I can do this. Oh. Google um, the code of the principles of ethics and code of professional conduct of the ADA and watch this video. This should be our cause. We're here to treat our patients. We're not here to fill our pockets with do re mi, right? Because that will only bring legal action someday, right? We're here to treat patients. We're here to do good service to people because they gave us a privilege to do so. Yeah? And if you do it well and you're kind, you'll have plenty in your life. You'll have an abundance. You just go for treating the tooth 
and endure the patient, you'll have lots of work, but you'll also have lots of fun. Perfect. Perfect. We got to focus on our patients. So I'd like to bring out, um, I'd like to highlight a couple of things. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on this too long, but I need you guys to understand. If you're going to practice dentistry in California, you may have a higher chance of, of getting legal action if you don't assess for cavity risk. Uh, treating the cavities or signs and symptoms of the infection while ignoring the bacterial biofilm infection at the source may very well and rightly should put your dental practice at risk for being sued by the dental savvy patient. When the benefit of providing care exceeded the risks, then not offering scientifically proven benefits to patients is unreasonable care and thus careless. Placing uh, patients at risk for otherwise avoidable risks is unreasonable and thus a negligent violation of the standard of reasonable care. He concluded, this is a case about a patient who went into the dentist and the dentist never did a cavity risk assessment when he did like 23 crowns or some papers in the airplane or whatever. And, uh, you know, after about three years, all the teeth fell out, and then he had to do a denture and whatever and whatnot. The patient sued him and won. He never did a cavity risk assessment at all. Never found out that the patient was at high risk for developing more cavities. This case out of California, I talked to the attorney, actually. Called him up on the phone. Nice guy. You can Google this article, Sued Over Caries, California. So basically what I'm trying to talk about here, guys, is that there's a couple of different ways of looking at things. You can look at things like a cash register and uh, have this procedure-based thinking that a lot of us get swept into. Anybody give me an example of procedure-based thinking? Hold on, let me give you the mic. There are some dental clinics or offices that are that have decided that every patient should leave with some sort of procedure on the bone. That's to me that shows the driven by the economics. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna bill for OSHA. I'm gonna bill twelve dollars because I have to break down, set up my room, I'm gonna bill for anesthetic, I'm gonna bill the place for rubber dam. I actually agree with this in some ways because hospitals do it, but go ahead. I don't know if they do it anymore. I know a lot of offices, um, not even but I know a lot of them have quotas to only five pounds today. Perfect. She said some, uh, we won't use the word, dental offices have quotas for production, right? I'm going to need to do five crowns today, Doc, right? So that also translates to the hygienists too. Hygienists are paid on production. Everybody's paid on production. When we're paid on production, guess what? We want to do as many procedures as possible. I got a plane to buy. You know what I mean? I need to buy my Hummer. I'm gonna make a lot of money. I'm gonna do some endo over here, crown over here, crown, 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 crown. Everything turns into a crown. You know? This is procedure-based billing. This is a thought pattern that we are in, this is a paradigm, so to say, that our profession is in. But who loses when we think this way? Who loses? Got a patient call up, oh, hi, how are you doing? Are you a new patient? Yeah. What kind of dental insurance do you have? Oh, you don't have dental insurance? Do you have a toothache? Oh, okay. How will you be paying for this today? We discriminate. We discriminate. Financial discrimination. Okay. Doc needs a new plane. You don't have any money. He can't see it. He'll, he can see it in three weeks. Oh, well, here's the number of the guy down the street. He may be able to see it. Go ahead. Mark Twain said, a boy, to a boy with a hammer, everything's a nail. And we get in that mode sometimes in dentists where we stop looking at the details and start generalizing production. There's a fine line between being ethical and careful 
and just starting to say everything that comes in at two surfaces gets a crown. It's a problem with the field offices, and I'm sure it's a problem with other offices. Perfect. Did you guys understand that? Good? Okay. Thanks, Dr. Cheever. So what we're trying to do here, guys, is, is let you know that there is a problem, okay? Socioeconomic groups with low levels of dental use, non-Hispanic blacks, Hispanics, those with low family income and low educational attainment by head of household also have been documented to have a higher prevalence of untreated decay than a general population who's gonna treat these people, okay? And we have outcomes-based thinking. Outcomes-based thinking. Are my patients driving around with no oil in their cars? <laughs> do I even care? I just want to do another crown. Right? What do you think this cancer patient on the left, what do you think she's thinking? I'm grateful I'm alive, right? Quality of life. Anybody know who the guy on the left is? Bob? We love Bob. I love Bob Ross. So we have a biological versus mechanical model. Who are you is the question. Well, guess what? We have to be both, right? We have to be both. We have to be able to identify causative factors, signs, symptoms, and not only be able to identify them and diagnose them, but we also have to be able to treat every single thing that comes through our door, non-surgically or surgically, okay? So <clears throat> I heard a couple of practitioners this year, <clears throat> I was talking to them and they're like, well, you know, I can't change their behavior, right? If they're gonna eat Cheetos and drink Mountain Dew, I can't change that. So why do I need to talk to them? I'm not gonna change their behavior. Why do nutritional counseling? No big deal, right? Well, guess what? We need to do everything we can do in order to help them. Just because they choose not to comply doesn't mean that we don't have an obligation to do everything we can do to help them, right? Just a thought. So where does dentistry begin? Does it begin at the tip of that needle? It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Perfect. So you get the needle when prevention fails. You get the needle. When diplomacy fails, you get the gun. When prevention fails, you get the needle. Okay. Again, a little bit back to GV Black. It's not that the profession was ignorant of the biological nature of dental caries. G.B. Black in 1908 in his textbook, Operative Dentistry, stated that this attitude is, quote, an anomaly in science that should not continue. It has the apparent tendency to make dentists mechanics only. Are you paying five, are you paying your, your, are you paying five dollars to become a mechanic? Do you want to be mechanics when you're done here? Mechanics or scientists, right? I mean, we can teach you how to drill on teeth all day long. We gotta, we gotta teach you how to treat the cause, recognize the signs, the symptoms, and treat the disease. In 1967, Masler stated that, quote, disturbing to witness the overly focused attention of some dentists on the operative and restorative phases of dentistry, the drilling and filling of teeth, to the neglect of the disease process, which causes the lesion, Cariology and the preoperative treatment of the wounded tooth bone. Okay, back in 1900. Okay, talking about fluoride, talking about fluoridation. You know, this uh, this is some stuff from cariology, so I'll I'll just kind of 
just kind of skim through this here. Young et al. criticizes that the term prevention has become a term that has been, quote, blanched and simplified into only mean brush and floss and don't eat sugar. Kid et al. astutely observed that the oral prophylaxis or dietary counseling or oral hygienic instruction are given by the dental assistants, not by the dentists, thus making the patients think that they are unimportant. What do you think? Low patient compliance is the direct result of this wrong message. Perhaps prescriptions and advices fade out in the face of the action-packed filling procedure. Guys, these are quotes I'm pulling from articles here, okay? I'm not making this stuff up. Essentially, all the treatment strategies under the umbrella of prevention either alter or modify the causative factors in the dental caries etiology, such as diet factor, host factor, salivary factor, and the microbial factor. Should we go through the billings of our dental school and see when the last time we did a microbiological test was? How many procedures do you think we've done since you guys entered your class, how many dental procedures do you think our school has billed out for? 100,000? 200,000? Do you think we billed for a cavity risk assessment test? Maybe? What about a salivary test? I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to put a target on my back, even though I probably have one there, but we can do better, can't we? Let's do it. It's what's going to happen when the insurance companies demand positive outcomes, demand that type of change rather than see the restoration. Would you talk about that just a little bit? Do you mind, please? Okay. Sorry to hurt me enough. But so in the state of Connecticut and in the state of Massachusetts, Medicare, which is the health insurance for 65 and older, is now doing outcomes-based reimbursement. Meaning if Mrs. Jones is out of the hospital and is living home and having a good life and has home health, that's a better outcome than having her brought in a hospital bed. And so the future of Reimbursement in dentistry may be different than what it is now. The cash pay patient is everybody's dream, but the challenge of this is that outcomes are becoming far more important than what you do. Yes, I'll do 10 restorations, but did this person's health improve? That's why it carries risk assessment and doing the non-mechanical before the mechanical is important. That's why we're talking about it. Thanks, Dr. Schubert. And just to add on that, you will see the day when you put oh, a restoration. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I, this is important. Well, I see it coming, that you will see the day, because they're already doing it in roundabout ways now, that you put a restoration in, and before they reimburse you, they will say, what is this patient's risk, and what did you do to decrease that risk before you put the bill in? It will get to that point, that's where it is, now, and that will be that wouldn't surprise me if it's in the very near future, particularly as our healthcare costs go up. Our our socialized medicine countries all around us are asking these questions and pushing these questions because cost for them has become very real. And so, just know this type of question: your insurance company will say you did an ammo filling, but did you prevent it? Are you going to keep it from coming back? If you haven't done that. We'll wait to reimburse you. That is on the future um, if we see this coming that way. So, so understanding this and understanding how to prevent it, we are we are forcing ourselves as a society. Thanks, Doc. So a lot of this has to do with coding. Does anybody know what ICD-10 codes are? Okay, what are ICD-10 codes? Like 
diagnostic codes. <clears throat> so in medicine, they have a diagnostic code and a procedure code. So you might have like a K5 S.1029.1. So you have a diagnostic code and the procedure code kind of separated by a dot. In dentistry, we have, okay, failing D2393. Uh, That's the procedure. We are a procedure-based profession. We have no diagnostic code at all. That will change. I'm just curious here, as long as we're on, on this subject, I'm just curious by show of hands, how many people think dentistry is a part of medicine? Take your hand. Anybody? How many people don't think that dentistry is part of medicine? Right here? How many people don't care? <laughs> All right. Um, interesting. Interesting, interesting. Um, how many people think that our dental coding system could use a facelift? Anybody? Don't know? How many people think that dentistry and medicine will be one billing code in the future? Anybody think, does anybody know what the electronic health record is? Anyone? Ever, anyone ever been to the doctor? Everybody has an electronic health, health record. She thinks it's hilarious. She's been la laughing the whole time. You guys must have some good social media going on around here. But anybody um, know what an electronic health record is? Can you explain, please? So there, the, the health records that Medical field, that's how they pull the outcomes. They can be hospital databases and you can do per performance based outcomes because you have these records and you can pull the data. You can pull the data. Do doctors pull the data or do healthcare management systems pull the data? So that's what they're working on. I mean, it's a huge project um, that's big. But the idea is that this data can go all over the place and can be used at managed care systems, but the state and the Anybody hear of uh, evidence based dentistry? Yes. Okay. <laughs> is evidence based or anecdotal based dentistry better? Would you rather have a doctor practice anecdotally on you or evidence based? Perfect. Thank you. Good answer. So, do you think that the dental record should be merged into the electronic health record? Why? We're just dentists. But the oral systemic relationship is, you know, it, there's a connection there. And the more that we can link that data, the more information we have, the better decisions we can where does the inferior alveolar nerve go to as soon as it goes out of your jaw? What foramen? Do you remember? Does it not go from your jaw up through the foramen valley into your brain stem? So at what point does the uh, nerve not become part of your body? Before or after it goes into the cranium? Okay. Is it still part of your body? In other words, we take our mouths out and just put them in our pocket, walk around and stuff like that. I have a problem with that. Sorry to go on my little soapbox. I, you know, 
we are just as big a part of medicine as medicine is a part of us. And we can work together. We can do great things. It's awesome. Especially when you start talking about microbiota. Dr. Cheever, would you just give a little cameo on microbiota? Well, before that, Dr. Stewart just made a superb point. The difference here, tell them what you're just talking about. Because we've been drill and fill for many years, we've been independent of insurances. We look for fee-for-service patients. So for many years, up until even recently, most of the patients were fee for service, so we weren't involving insurance, third party payers, that type of thing. We're all independent practitioners. Now, Obama has passed a law that insures and gives dental coverage to anyone that comes into the insurance table. And every participant in this country is required to have insurance, and on that insurance table is dentistry. So now we just got sucked into the insurance industry, and the insurance industry is regulated and watched like a hawk. So we now just became part of medicine from a personal perspective. So that's when we talk this and where we're going, clinically based dentistry, that's how medicine works is clinically based medicine. We just became part of that family. So the reality of it now is very real. And so we have to dance and dance and learn to walk or we won't be in the university in the future. And don't panic. You're gonna make a great living. Forbes just said dentistry's number one the best job in America. We're talking theoretically, but a lot of this, we're stirring your thought because we want you to be smart as you go forward to the future. Anybody heard of your microbiome? Are you waiting for me? Cool. Do you need signatures? This is being a dean right here. So the microbiome, how many cells are in your system? How many cells are in your body? You're going to be an oral surgeon. Tell us. Roughly 100 trillion. And multiple, multiple, multiple more cells in your microbiome, bacterial and, and other cells in your microbiome. Your gut, your gut is host to more bacteria, multiple bacteria, more than your dysfunction. <laughs> and so, Dr. David Agus, who is at USC, is a cancer specialist, and what they're doing is mapping the human proteome. They're mapping proteins. And so, with illness and systemic illness, they may be able to look at the microbiome, map the human proteome, and so you might get a blood test that says, this protein is high, therefore you have X disease. The world of disease is changing. And this microbiome, they want to look at it as a separate organ because it's so unique. Anybody have celiac? Anybody have, uh, have uh, Crohn's? Anybody have irritable bowel? There's a lot going on there that we don't know. What about C. diff? Clostridium difficile. You get this bacteria overgrowth and you get really sick. And so do you know what they're doing? They're taking feces from healthy patients, putting it through and transplanting it, and guess what? People get better. So we have a whole lot to look at in disease. And oddly, this goes completely through us. It's amazing. The microbiome is going to change the world. Thank you. Look at it. Thanks, Dr. Cheever. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Anybody want to take a break? Should I just keep rolling here? Or? Right? So the mouth is the gateway to the body, okay? And uh, we're, we're on, we are on the verge. And up in our third floor, we're, we're you know, we're going to start doing proteomics. Next time you're on Google, just type in salivary proteomics. Who owns saliva collectively? You guys. You own this. This is your turf. It's your territory. Okay, this is a classical Carey's uh, decision-making process. Uh, let me back up a little bit here. We've got uh, uh, Carey's treatment decision. So I asked you a little bit early when the when the last time we billed for a cavity risk assessment test as a school. Um, Anybody think we've ever built for one of those yet? 
No. There are insurance codes for it. As of 2015, MetLife was reimbursing for uh, county risk assessment codes. Um, but you see here on the sheet where it says CRA, how many times did it say CRA? Quite a few. Is it hard to do a CRA? Is it tough? Can you get reimbursed for it? Does it leave a better outcome for your patients? Cool. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's not only do it, but let's be the pathology lab that does the read as well. Okay, cavity risk assessment, cavity risk assessment, cavity risk assessment, everywhere. It's everywhere. It's all over the place, okay? Everywhere. Uh, I'm not really gonna go over this. We've kind of talked about it a little bit. Okay. There's a lot of guidelines. Uh, one of them's Canberra, one of them's ICDAS. We've got a lot of different systems out there, guys. Okay, a lot of different bodies of people doing a lot of different studies. Okay, but the bottom line is people are starting to talk more and more about cavity risk and all of the different factors that go into uh, custom tailoring a treatment plan for a patient. Okay, Dr. Featherstone, he's, he's a big player out on the West Coast. He, uh, he talks about the balancing factors, okay? We've got protective factors, we've got um, cavity promoting factors, okay? And, and our body is in a constant uh, equilibrium of pathologic and protective factors. So the microbiome has a lot to do with this, okay? Um, in 2003, Featherstone talked a little bit about a caries risk assessment procedure. Um, he started to do some clinical trials at UCSD and recently published with Sophie here in 2011, 2015, and uh, they're going to reshape the way that people think about dentistry. Um, anybody see this picture? You guys recognize this? Who's this guy? What movie is that from? Okay. We need to start thinking about odds ratios, okay? So when we talk about odds ratios, I can play you this video. It's, it's about 4.10 right now. I'm going to skip it. But I would encourage you guys to uh, uh, review what an odds ratio is. Okay. We've got a study here by Featherstone, um, randomized clinical trial done at UCSF. Okay. They identified the risk factors. Okay. Do you remember the slide? Slides we had a little while ago about identifying the causes, causes of the disease and treating the factors associated with that. Well, we have disease indicators that are clinical. We have biological risk factors. And we have protective factors. So tell me, just by looking at this uh, chart, what the highest indicator uh, clinical observation indicator for cavities is. Anyone? It's hard to read, guys. Okay, sorry about that. 8.2 odds ratio for uh, enamel lesions. Okay, that's pretty obvious. Um, heavy plaque on the teeth, 2.6 odds ratio. Okay, and, and it goes down from there. Uh, but if you look at the bottom, it talks about how strep, high strep mutans levels, um, 89.7% of the population that had high strep mutan levels had caries. And the same with uh, lactobacilli. So is it important to be taking a look at strep mutans levels? Should we go ahead and do a whole quadrant full of fillings on our 17-year-old kid without even taking a look at what his strep mutans levels are? I thought it would be a difficult time to see the benefit of it, like, because you can see cavity risk and then you can see the caries. So right now, clinically, we're saying that they're at high risk. What is the benefit of seeing it like, in numbers? 
seeing it in numbers helps you quantify it and put it in a data format. So then we have it in data format. Then we can How measure outcomes with it. Can I do something before I put it like You should. You should. Absolutely. Good question. Can you ask that one more time? Go ahead. So everyone can hear. Perfect. Perfect. Brush and floss, and we'll see you in six months. Perfect, right? So in our case before, where we had the 15-year-old, I briefly mentioned that you could use chlorhexidine. You can give him an antibacterial rinse to use regularly to lower that level. You can put him in fluoride trays, make the surfaces of the enamel harder before it breaks down, and in theory, it's pretty easy to reverse a surface lesions if you have somebody stop drinking whatever's causing the problem, keep it clean, lower the plaque levels, and you know, take care of their hygiene. There's lots of ways to do it. We use these tools to help us understand who's at risk. That case today what rolled into this perfectly because you have a patient where everything has failed, including his attitude. Perfect. So um, I'm trying to highlight odds ratio. Do you remember how in the, in the uh, 2011 study with Featherstone and uh, Domagiana, I call her Sophie, Sophie and Featherstone. You remember how uh, seeing, an, seeing a cavity on an x-ray was like 8.3 odds ratio of finding disease in the mouth? Okay, look at this study. This study came out of Saudi Arabia. Okay. This actually throws another factor in there of uh, salivary secretions, buffering capacity, BC. Check that out, 9.4, high strep mutant CFUs. Anybody know what CFU is? Call it a forming unit, you can measure it. And low buffering capacity. Okay, so without even looking at an x-ray, I don't even have to expose my patient to x-ray. All I have to do is take dipstick, put it in their mouth, whoosh, put it on a plate, whoosh, send it away. And guess what? That's more accurate than taking an x-ray to know if cavities are in the patient's mouth. See what I'm saying? That's more accurate. 9.4. If a patient has high strep mutants and a low buffering capacity, that's more accurate than taking an x-ray. What's the specificity? Of that, sure. You know, they have that. That's not like an acute x-ray. Right. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. I'm just banging my drum. Man. That's all. I'm just banging my drum. That's all. I just want you guys, I'm trying to open up the, the space in your mind, I'm trying to open up a new paradigm here, okay? This is a diagnostic tool that you can do, that you can profit from, that you can make money off of, that you can generate procedures off of, that you can buy a plane with. That will actually help your patients get a better outcome of care, okay? And it will also actually lower your risk of legal exposure if you work in California. Okay? So camera guidelines and interventions. Do you guys remember the uh, high mileage vehicle? Remember that little odometer was like 198 some thousand miles on it? Okay, that car is gonna require more service than the brand new car. So a patient with a high cavity risk, okay, they're gonna require more intervals. They're gonna require more service. They're gonna require coming back to the office more, okay? Higher compliance, right? That's the bottom line here. They're going to get more dentistry, more preventive services, more clinical protocols. Okay, we've got this thing called a CRT bacteria test. All right, it's very expensive right now, but we can do it. We can order it from the catalog. Do you guys want to try it out? Yes. Who who doesn't want to try the CRT bacteria test? Raise your hand. Okay, I've got a couple up in my office. Do you guys want to do like a breakout? Maybe Dr. Cheever can, can arrange something like that. Would you guys want to do that? Check out this CRT test. Maybe write a report to the dean, see, see what you guys think about it. Good, okay. All right. 
So I'm going to try to fly here. I have about 15 minutes. I know you guys are probably tired of me, but I'm going to just keep on going, okay? Chlorhexidine. Dr. Cheever talked about chlorhexidine, all right? You mentioned, is there a way to take from high to low risk? Well, it's all about the CFU number. So the guy comes in with 10 to the 6 CFUs of the MS or whatever, strep mutans. Your goal is to get them down to like 10 to the 2 CFU. So what do you do? You bomb it with chlorhexidine. You give them a protocol. I'll show that to you in a minute. There's articles written about that. Okay, give them 0.12%, 10 mLs daily. Reduces MS markedly and LB somewhat. Repeat every month. Okay, caries risk patients might not be considered at risk for caries. Primary prevention by definition is intended to prevent disease from occurring before any pathology is present. Oh, that's low caries risk. So what that's saying is even though, let's say you would test the patient comes back low. Darn it, I shouldn't have done the test. And we should do it on everybody. Wouldn't you want to know if you're low risk? Or your uh, fiance is low risk. No very garbage now. <laughs> Good point. Um, so this is an antibacterial, okay, we've got 0.12% chlorhexidine gluconate. Um, it's got alcohol in it. It goes by the name of Periagar, Peridex, Periorx, and gum chlorhexidine gluconate oral rinse, okay? <clears throat> this talks a little bit more about it, how you use it. If you guys want, I can give you a whole spiel on that later on down the road. Um, one thing to point out is that Chlorhexidine works well on strep mutans. It doesn't necessarily work with lactobacillus. Just FYI. Um, Water-based chlorhexidine should be considered for those at extreme risk for caries or any patient who is intolerant of alcohol. So, pediatric dental patients. Okay, you need to keep in mind you probably don't want to give them chlorhexidine. That you want to give them water-based chlorhexidine. Okay. Yep, if they're if they're in an abuse, a lot of patients are trained to uh, deal with alcohol. Okay. So before the therapy, we do a baseline CRT bacteria test. All right, just taking it with like Socrates. Before we do our intervention, we measure, and we measure after our intervention, then we measure again, then we measure again, then we measure again. And through these measurements, we can tell whether they need more interventions. Okay, pretty basic, right? Makes you wonder why we haven't been doing it. So the protocol for a low risk, we're gonna do over-the-counter fluoride containing toothpaste twice daily. For moderate risk, you got the um, OTC fluoride um, plus fluoride rinse. Okay, then with a high risk, you got a varnish, you got a fluoridated toothpaste, and with an extreme risk, you got more interventions, okay? So these are, this is not invasive dentistry here, guys. We don't have to use our needle to do this, right? We don't have to use our drill. And we can actually measure the outcomes. It's hard to measure the outcomes when you use your drill. You know, you know qualitatively if it's good or not, but you don't really know numbers okay high fluoride toothpaste require a prescription um, many clinicians have experienced dramatic increases in success by dispensing all caries management products directly to the patient so what does that mean that means you order the supplies you keep them in your office you sell those supplies to your patients okay that's what that means okay and there's a lot of them. There we go, there's a couple pictures. You guys been up in the clinics yet? Have you seen these things? Anybody work in a dental office? You know what these are? Would you like me to bring a sample? I mean, I can bring a sample down and show them to you guys if you want to. We can have a whole workshop on all this stuff if you'd like, just let me know, okay? I think you guys need to understand the protocol. So first, first week you do your baseline test, you get your strep mutan count, 
<clears throat> and then you prescribe your chlorhexidine, okay? There's a chart. Great, yeah, and, and um, chlorhexidine and, and uh, fluoride can, they need to be used in a special way that we could talk about later if you want to. I don't know how much time now, but this is week two. There's more information. After week two, you do another test, see the outcome of your intervention, or what a concept. Then you do week three followed by week four. And you do that for about a year. Okay, keep following the intervals and protocols. And this, last of all, my friends, I love codes, I love numbers. This is a sheet. We should see, see the uh, tests and exams, the D0415. The D0417. These are codes we can be billing for here. You know what I mean? New patient exam, for example, patient calls. And I'll give you the new patient. Okay, cool. Here, we're going to send you a saliva test. Go ahead and send it back to us. We'll have your information ready when you come in. Right? It'd be nice, wouldn't it? And when they come in, you can do a cavity risk assessment and bill out for 0601. Right? If they're high risk, you can bill out a 59.94 the medication. Then you can do an 0415 to collect microorganisms. You might do an 0417 to evaluate their saliva. You can bill out an 0418 after you re read the saliva sample. You could even do an 0418 if they have a family history of cancer to screen for, for cancer. You know, all kinds of stuff. And then you, you do a 96.30 at the end with your chlorhexidine and your drugs. Um, so that does not include writing prescriptions. So other drugs and or medicaments by report. So these are procedures that we can build for that we can, that we can actually get better outcomes for our patients with. So I'm all about that. someone who comes in and is conscientious, you do the, the strep mutans testing, show them where they are relative to normal, and use that as a motivation tool. The hard part is insurance won't always reimburse for these, but are they applicable? Absolutely, especially the kid that has a mouthful of restoration. What's the reflection going to be from primary to primary teeth? Are, you, are we all tracking here? Did I lose you? Anybody have any questions? Okay, thanks for paying attention. Let me just try to take this back. Do you guys remember the picture of the, uh, the dipstick and the oil? I'm gonna end my lecture by asking this question. If you were driving a car with children in it, would you wanna know if your oil was low. How would you know the oil was low? What signs would you look for? Smoking coming out of the engine? By then it's a little too late, right? How about a red light that comes on on the dashboard? Yeah. Okay. How many people don't want to have a dipstick. How many people don't care what their oil level is? So knowing that you have low oil, are you going to be so distracted that you don't take care of your engine and you don't put oil on there? Are you going to be so distracted by what's going on in dentistry that you're not going to pay attention to the signs and symptoms that your own system is failing? 
Are you going to put oil in your car? Okay, guys. That's it. Thanks for paying attention. Okay, so next Monday at 1 o'clock, the real block of, of hardcore starts. We're focusing on the hardcore testable version of primary teeth and pediatric dentistry. We'll give you a syllabus, a schedule, we'll make sure everything's correct. Next Monday at 5, we start the two-week block. Who has to remediate ortho? Good luck if you have to do it. I know it's a challenging test. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. This is going to be where we're headed. We're going to start looking at the bacteria, start looking at the protein, start looking at what causes decay and all of the side effects and symptoms, and then we're going to build a case to prevent it. Have a good, good night.